Say hi. You say hi. Say hi. That's my glasses. That's my glasses. I need my glasses. This, this is nasty. Is so nasty. I think I'm pretty well cleaned up. Oh my gosh, what a long day so far. I've got my bench cleaned up. I've got my first repair picked out for this morning. I've been at it since three o'clock in the morning. So I'm gonna get out of here. I'm gonna grab something to eat and I'm gonna come back here. Whenever I get back, I'm gonna try to fix something in front of a camera. We'll see how that goes. What I've come to realize is that no matter how much stuff you have on your plate, no matter how many irons you have in the fire, that you really have to focus on your, your fundamental needs. You'll have all these things that you, that you wanna do, but in order to be successful, you have to reach out, you have to grab a hold of the things, the core necessities that you're gonna to have to have and pull them in close to you. Um, income is actually above food. Depending on where you live in the world, most of you will probably find out that income is above food. Because if you don't have income, you can't have food. You can't really easily turn food into income. So income sort of goes all the way at the top of the chain. Income, that, that's at the very top. Somebody please explain that to my wife. I'm trying to talk her into doing things a little bit differently. But as you know, we live together. She knows everything about me. And listening to me talk on a video is the last thing that she'll ever do. So I'm like, I am free to say whatever I want. She'll never know. And don't any of you tell her either. Man, I sure want that sandwich. That's, that's part of my core needs right now. I need food in my belly. Yeah, I'm gonna have a uh, Asiago bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich. Okay. And a uh, medium Pepsi, please. Anything else for you? Nope, that'll be all. Do you have a My Panera card with us? I do. Can I get the phone number, please? Can you give a dollar off a beverage that you want to use that today? Sure. All right, make sure total 605 and we'll see you at the window. Thank you. 605. That is cheap breakfast. Costs a lot of money to eat nowadays. Got it? Have a good day. Thank you. So good. Oh man, I love these things. I haven't had one of these things since we moved the shop. When we quit taking walk in repairs, we moved the shop and I haven't had one of these since then. Oh, these are so good. Check. <clears throat> there we go. Hey everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Jason. I sit here all day long and I fix teeny tiny little microelectronics with a stereo microscope and little bitty tools and puffs of hot air. Today I'm going to be working on an iPhone 6 that has made its way around the world. It has been in multiple repair shops after a close encounter with water. And it has wound up here on my bench and our hopes here is that we can get the data off of this phone. So let's go ahead and have a, a look and see what we are up against. I have no idea what I'm up against. I take that back. I lied. I have looked at the top side of this one just briefly. But just briefly. I haven't hooked power to it. I haven't did anything in depth, so I really don't know what I'm getting into. Let's go ahead and turn our microscope light on. And get my glasses out of the way. Oh, 
I've rearranged my shop. I used to have a toolbox here I'd put my foot on. It's not there no more. So you guys are going to watch me bust my face on the bench like 10 times during this video. Let's have a look at this thing and see what we're up against before I do anything else. I am going to switch you over and let you have a nice close up close in person look at this marvelous masterpiece under the under the under the seriously under the microscope all right here we are so at first glance it looks like well, we got a little bit more in the water going on here we got some fluxy flux so somebody's done some rework on it our anode pin on that connector is completely toast it is missing fl2024 however fl2024 is is fluffed up nice and neat where it should be uh, so somebody knew that there was a bigger problem because they did not bother putting that on there who in the heck is going to fix backlight if there's a bigger problem let's have a look and see what we are up against you can see from this battery connector here that the bottom shield's been off. The bottom shield has been toothbrushed. Oh, this one scares the hell out of me. Oh, no, look, the bottom shield has actually been bent right here. What in the God's creation? Oh, well, hey, we have writing. Oh, shit, that's the customer's name scratched on it. Seriously? Let's take the board out of this thing. I've worked on rabbit holes for three days this week, and look what I sit down and work on. Honestly... I know I didn't plan on getting directly into a rabbit hole repair here, but it um, seems to be that this is video material. So let me see if I can get everybody here in front of the camera for you. Move everything around here. I do have to tell you, I don't use this mat if I'm not recording a video. So if you're buying one of these mats just to like try to solder like me, don't. I don't solder on this thing. Like If I, if I dig in and I want to get like kick-ass balls to the walls, get my repairs done, this mat gets thrown behind me on a table. Probably going to try a fiberglass mat here pretty soon. I've had a couple of people tell me to use a fiberglass mat, and I do admit, if I continue to burn this bench, I'm eventually going to burn all the way through and out the other side. And originally, and I still may do it, I had planned on cutting out a hole right here and replacing it with a small hot plate that I can still work around because I think it would just be an absolute joy to be doing these repairs on preheated boards I am constantly preheating the board anyway only I'm doing it by hand and I hold the hot air nozzle with my left hand and hold the temperature of the board up while soldering with my right hand it's a real pain in the ass if you need to manipulate something or do something else because it takes up an entire hand for me to add a hot plate here to hold, or anything to hold the temperature of my board up, would give me an extra hand, and that's a big deal. Everybody needs another hand these days. You got to work your ass off to survive nowadays. You have to literally make buckets and buckets and buckets full of money to keep the wolves at bay. And even then, it don't last very long because if you slip up and you quit making money for a little bit. they come back and they come back and not only do they want the money that you you already owed them but since you were a little wait, little bit late paying the wolves they want more money and that'll teach your ass to be broke you don't want to pay me on time how about an extra 50 bucks huh that'll teach you next time to be broke i have to highly encourage anybody that is sick of uh, paid slavery Anybody that is tired of doing something that they hate. Anybody that gets out of bed in the morning and feels like you want to go back to bed and you feel like you want to stay in bed, that, that, that's a horrible, horrible way to live. I've been there three quarters of my life. I'm 35 years old and I am just now learning how to reach out and grab a hold of my goals. I am just now learning how to reach out and, and set deadlines and set goals for myself. And between myself and the goal, keep it. But I've spent my entire life letting what other people think dictate my actions. Almost every single thing that I do, I get out of bed and it's like, well, what would this person think? And what would that person think? And every move that I make was based upon people around me and what other people think. And what I've done here 
in just the last couple of years and with what you see going on right here around me with what you see with me sitting here right here on your screen or, or on your phone or however it is that you're watching me um, what has happened here is that in the last couple of years I have learned how to think for myself and to quit letting other people affect what I do since I've done that what I have found out is that I can do whatever I want like I can do absolutely anything that I want as long as I'm prepared to accept the consequences um, I don't have to sit here and fix this as long as I don't want to get paid for it and if I don't get paid for it well then I might not have a spot to sit and do the repair so that brings me back to the core fundamentals the core things that you have to survive some days it feels like I'm gonna be completely totally buried in these little blue baskets like I'll get them over here up against the wall stacked up to this white sign and all the way out to here and and then crisscrossed and lined up out here and the stuff you see out here under the 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 deck is usually rabbit holes and really really difficult stuff that I don't want to deal with I've got that filtered out a little bit right this second but by this evening I'm bringing a handful of rabbit holes back onto the table and then I'm gonna be tackling those as well if I didn't want anything like if I didn't want money if I didn't want to provide a life for my kids or have a family I could be living in a tent somewhere I mean seriously if I didn't have expectations or things that I wanted I wouldn't have a need for an income so long as nobody minded me living under a bridge. I guess what I'm getting at here is that with all of this clutter in my life, with all these things buried on top of me and the shelves mountain, mountain piled high full, combined with other side projects and family things going on and this kid has this going on and this one has this going on and it's all these things going on, it can turn into this, just this, this static that could make any normal person just want to give up and go lay down and just be like, oh, and, and want to block it out. Because once you start to get so much commotion and so many things going on, it can, it, it, it can be overwhelming and make you feel like doing absolutely nothing. It can be discouraging. So if you're at a point in your life where you have all this crap going on and it's just, it's just it's absolute chaotic madness like I have been for over the period of the last five years, you have to reach out and grab a hold of these core fundamentals that you need to survive and your fundamentals your core needs are going to be different depending on who you are and and what your what your wants are so if you have these far-sighted goals of things that you want but there's no way that you can get to those goals without these things over here being in place then you can't neglect these things over here and expect to reach out and make it to your goal um, for instance I have a goal of building this YouTube channel and about oh, I guess two maybe three weeks ago I noticed that I was struggling a little bit to cross the 700,000 minutes per month barrier yeah 700,000 minutes per month who would watch this for 700,000 minutes per month so I thought man one day one day I'm gonna get to 800,000 minutes you know what I'm gonna try to do it soon I'm gonna see how long it's gonna take me to get to 800,000 minutes and I started posting more many of you may have noticed I post quite a bit more frequently now and that's gonna pick up as well as the format of my videos and how this is all put together that's all gonna be changing quite a bit too because I found this newfound joy in doing this what I'm doing I am reaching out and I'm grabbing a hold of my goal I wanna see this grow um, I wanna do more on this channel I want did I just say more on oh, shit I wanna do more on I did more on anyways I wanna be more successful with this channel and I set this goal, I'm gonna smash 800,000 minutes. Well, here I am, a week and a half, two, I'd have to go back and look at my Facebook post. But here I am, I'm rolling over 947,000 minutes monthly. And that's, that's insane, that's 947,000 minutes in 28 days. Now I know if you take that and you divide that amongst all my views, it's probably like, oh man, people are only watching you for like two minutes. But still, it's a big deal for me, and it's a goal that I set, and I've kept it. And what this channel is doing for me, it's not bringing in a whole lot of money, but it is absolutely keeping my shelves stacked full of work. So it has given me this, um, this opportunity for the work to come to me and for me to be able to do this at my own pace. Most of the time, I'm getting ready to have to raise turnaround time or do something because I'm sort of getting swallowed alive and that's not any good position to be in either. But with all this clutter and everything that I've got going on in my life and every, each and every kid's got their... You know, they've got their life and my wife's got all her stuff going on. In order to keep a handle on things, 
I have to focus on my, my core responsibilities. That is my, you know, I'm not going to itemize each and every one of them uh, because they tend to change from day to day, but I know the ones that I mainly focus on, and that is my income, my marriage, my kids, okay? Without these three things, I don't have anything. If I don't have a marriage, I'm not with my kids, and my ambition to do what I'm doing now and my ambition to succeed every day is going to be much less. I'm most likely going to fall apart. So I've got to have my marriage, and I've got to have my kids, and in order to have my marriage and my kids, they're going to need money because if I don't have money and I try to move these people out into tents and send them to school in ratty clothes and, and big holes in their shoes and stuff, I'm going to wind up losing my marriage and my kids. So I've got to have money to have my marriage and my kids, and I have to have my marriage and my kids in order for me to want to have money because I'm telling you right now, if it wasn't for having what I have in life and having something to reach out and have a goal and something to hold on to, I wouldn't be doing any of this. So it all goes hand in hand. It is the core things that support everything. There's not very many of them. So that is the absolute bottom line core. From there, you branch off to other things, and you know you got your income. You've got your different types of income, your different types of jobs. Um, if you've got any warranty work in, mixed in there, that's mixed up with it too because that takes away from your income. Um, so when you start at the core and you develop a tree under that and you work your way down or up, depending on if you're standing on your head or if you're sitting on the stool, um, things start to look a lot, a lot more positive, and you start to be it starts to be less stressful because those core things being in place gives you comfort that you're not going to lose everything when you start slipping up and you start getting sidetracked and screwing off and like beating your head over here like if I got this one rabbit hole and I just go at it all weekend long and come Monday I still haven't figured it out and I just stay at it and Tuesday and Wednesday and I'm still on this and I may never figure it out well then I'm letting my income go and if I let my income go you know my wife's not going to leave me over money she better not. She be, she better, babe. Um, but I'd be letting my income go. And even if you're not with somebody that would leave you because of your lack of income, it's going to affect how you feel. And what I mean by affect how you feel is if you start to be broke and you're not providing for the people that you are supposed to be providing for, assuming you're the one providing for your family, it's not always the guy. And... Um, let's not go there or I'll wind up getting tomatoes thrown at me. So it'll affect how you feel. So say your significant other is not going to say, you broke some bitch, you ain't made a dime in three weeks, our electric shut off. And um, you might have a significant other that is going to stay with you through the thick and thin. You know, they'll go live with you in a tent and they'll bring their kids with you and they'll farm or move off to move off out in the middle of the woods and live off the land. You might have a significant other that will stay with you no matter what. And even if that's the case, if all of a sudden you start to feel like you're not doing doing well for your family and you're not doing what it is that you're supposed to be doing, then that's going to lower your confidence. It's going to affect how you act. It's going to start making you think things. It'll start making you think that they're going to leave you. And you'll start feeling like you're not good enough. And when you start feeling like you're not good enough, you're not good enough. And you will really, you, you, you will make the bed that you sleep in. You'll pave your own road. You feeling like you're not good enough will actually cause you to not be good enough. So it's excruciating, excruciatingly important to stay positive and stay focused on your goals and keep reasons around to want to succeed. And it's just, it's, it's really, really important. And with all of that, you start to develop this sense of freedom because you realize that it's all up to you. You can do it however you want, as long as you do it. And that, that's a big deal. So here's reaching out and grabbing a hold of my goals. I hope this repair doesn't royally suck. Let's see what we're up against. This phone has been around the world. It has been in multiple shops. It has had logic board repair attempts. Um, it was not sent here for data, but whenever I said I couldn't fix it as a phone, then they would like to see if we can get the data. So. Let's take the board out of this thing, and hopefully I don't get sidetracked ranting about something that you most likely don't care about, but I'm telling you right now, I've, I'm learning to live my life by some of these fundamentals. Fun, fun, I can't even say fundamentals, and I'm trying to give advice. Yeah, here for repair, yet it's missing things and components. and uh, So let's go ahead. We've got the board out of it. Let's set this garbage aside. Let's set the screws aside. 
missing antenna cables and all right let's have a look at the one part of the board that we can see telling you right now this thing's had the power IC refloated see the flux all around the power IC this one's actually pretty bad and if that power IC has been off of the board that's probably going to be the end of my efforts here now I am happy to see they soldered the shield back on with an iron that means they was conscious I don't know if you can tell that or not, but that is soldered with an iron. They were conscious of not, not screwing anything up, so they didn't want to use any heat where heat wasn't necessary. Let's go ahead and pull the bottom shield off of this thing. Have a look under it. And here's me grabbing a hold of my goals. My goal, my core fundamental is to remove the bottom shield off of this phone. Well, they sure put some effort into soldering this back on. Hot air is almost at 350C. I'm going to back off here and let it come up to temp. This is 390. All right, let's take the shield off. Interesting that it's not wanting to come right up. There we go. It's because they have leaded solder on it. It's got this minty, um, this minty rosin smell that I remember smelling a lot whenever I was a kid learning electronics. Love that smell. Now you may notice I don't have a fume extractor sitting right here on the bench, but you may notice by background noise I move a lot of air through this room. Doing this type of work, I only produce little bitty puffs. If I'm going to produ produce a significant amount of smoke, I'll tend to hold my breath, but um, that's coming soon. I'm going to be rigging up the fume extractor that I had at my old bench, which is actually, it comes out and it extracts directly from my microscope head. And I might actually set that up on video, but I'm not completely sure. So, what are we up against? Let's have a look at bottom shield here. Data recovery, but TriStar has not been peeled off. Yeah, see here, TriStar is still 100% intact. I see a lot of corrosion. But my main concern is all the flux around that power I see. That, that's my biggest concern. All right, let's go back topside. We're going to pull CPU shield. I should just pull all the shields, but I'm making a video. I can't think. I do everything dumb just because I'm recording a video. This time we are going to go ahead and pull the last two shields. Oh, and you know what? This does not have the stuff on it <clears throat> that Apple normally put on it. It's got some leaded solder on it or something else that I don't know the melting point of. I have started pulling these shields off like Chris Long. But that's when they're using a much lower melting alloy. This alloy here is going to melt quite a bit higher, so I'm going to be extra careful with this. This is data. But it's been through so many other shops in multiple countries that I've got a really, really bad feeling about this one anyways. To think it actually came in here for a repair. All right, I see my, sil my mat starting to swell. That means the solder is getting ready to melt. Okay, we're going to move our tape just to fuzz. And let's pull the bottom shield off of this one. Not worrying about burning the battery connector because somebody already thoroughly burnt the battery connector. There was a time when I was first learning how to pull that shield where I had everything too hot and I like my tweezers slipped and the board went thong, and when it did it threw the bottom uh, flex connector pff, off the board along with the battery connector I am never gonna get used to this 
that toolbox right over here used to be under my feet and I moved it so that my video would look better and now I'm about to break my neck every time I go to put my foot up on it okay folks back to the microscope oh anybody want to play a trumpet or whatever oh oh lord okay Here's what we're up against. We are missing backlight inductor. We are missing VCC main cap here. VCC main cap. Uh -huh. Wait a minute. What am I working on? Is this an iPhone 6? Oh, yeah, it's an iPhone 6. Okay. But more importantly, more importantly, folks, is this little row of guys right here. Can you see what I'm pointing at? Remember, this is this is your two back um, VCC main cap, VCC main cap, and then you got one, two, three backlight caps. I think that's right. Either way, I'm still uploading. More importantly, are these guys right here. Uh, the first one is a data line for the camera one of the front or the back and then I think like the fourth one is like front or back camera but these two middle lines let me show you what these two middle lines do we are going to open up a schematic from Paulo from Portugal okay so here we are thank you Paulo for my schematic that is not all branded up with Chinese letters although I kinda of feel like the folks that put this out might deserve to have their branding on it since Apple's not handing it out willingly Okay, so let's go after, remember what we were looking at. Let's add, let me get microscope on here. And let's get this out of your way. Yet yeah, try to still leave it big enough so that you can see what I'm up against. Okay, and we're going to get right in. And we're going to look at R0706, R0303, and R0302, as well as R0704. Let's look at these first four because, as you can see under the microscope, somebody remind me to change my hotkeys. <clears throat> so, as you can see under the microscope, that is these first two, and there might be... There might be another one right there, but I can't I can't really tell. Let me get a little bit of alcohol on that. Let's let's clean that up just a little bit. A lot of alcohol. That's what I meant to say. Okay. So we can see there that there are our first two are missing. That's R0706. R0303, they're not actually missing. They're laying right there on the board. All right, so back over to our schematic. We're going to look for R0706. One from Paulo. I said thank you to Paulo. I can rename this file now. Paulo, your name's been on my screen ever since you sent me that file. Okay, so what did we say we were going to look for? I always keep... I keep like the list of my schematics as the first tab that way I can just like control click and open up multiple schematics so anyway we're gonna look for R0706 so it's gonna be R0706 and let's zoom in and find still don't have a searchable board view on this file though that's where I use ZXW so R0706 we have our PP1V8 line here that comes in and it goes through R0706. R0706 is a data line for the front camera. And we're going to go ahead and open up ZXW and see if we can tell which who is hooked together with what because we have something bridged here. It's probably nothing to worry about. Let's go ahead and open up our iPhone 6. All right, so let's go up here and have a look and see who's touching who. <clears throat> R0706, so we can see on the microscope that 
we have this side of these bridged together, that's fine. That gives us, you know, we've got a 100K or whatever. Let's look and see what the next one is. So we know what R0706 is. Now we want to find out what is R0303. <clears throat> because what we have is we've actually got, um, we have these two hooked together over here, which they're hooked together anyway, so that doesn't affect anything. We've actually got a resistor that goes across here to here, but it looks like a resistor actually touches the shielding on this dude here, which is going to be ground. So let's see exactly what we're up against. Let's look at that next. Uh, let's look at the next data line. Um, R zero three zero three. That is actually a data line. Okay, let's pull it up on the schematic since that, that's the way I did it last time. Let's look at R zero three zero three. R0303 is one of these I2C0 um, uh, I2C0 lines. These lines are for data communications, and with either one of those lines missing, a phone will typically draw 80 or 100 milliamps. Don't troll me on that. They'll draw a little bit of power, but they won't completely boot. These lines have to be live. And the way this works, this data line, this AP to I2C0 um, underscore SCL, um, is CL, is that clock line? And DA is data line? I'm not sure. Maybe somebody will correct me on that. Either way, I look at both of these lines as needed for data. And the way this works is that this line by itself is low. It's, it doesn't have, there, there's not a signal there. And the way this works is that we've got our PP1V8 power rail here that's up here high. It's got 1V8 power rail. It's like, yay, I'm high, I'm way up here. And it's looking down here on these data lines and what it needs to do is it needs to pull this data line up to 1.8 volts, but it can't do it so firmly that nothing can blip and pull it down and, and generate signal on that line. So in order to pull that line up high, it does it with a resistor. And that's what these resistors are here. So since I am sidetracked and doing a thousand things at once, hey, I'm focusing on my core fundamentals, fundamentals here. My core is to fix this phone and get their data so that they can have whatever it is that they want out of this phone back in their hands and I can have a little bit of income for spending this time and ultimately I would like for this repair to work out so that this will be a successful repair on this video because this video is going to get posted regardless of whether or not it's successful. If I continue to only post successful repairs, this channel is going to get to be like a bass fishing show where, where like every time you turn it on, the dude's reeling in a nine pounder. Like every cast, bam, nine pound bass. And that's what's going to happen here if I don't start posting failures because failures do happen. They happen to me. They happen to everybody. They're going to happen to you too. So we have R0... Where am I? Zoom in farther because I'm not wearing my glasses. R0706, that is um, a data line for the front camera. We can live without you. But R0303, that is a data line that we're going to need for this phone to boot. Um, that data line does all kinds of stuff, and I know that without it, nothing works. So let's not be too worried about R0706. Let's worry about R0303. That is supposed to be a 2.2K resistor, according to ZXW tool. Let's confirm that on the schematic that I have here. And let's confirm that I don't get them crossed up. R0303. R0303 is supposed to be a 2.2K resistor. Let's get in and have a closer look at this. Okay, and let's see now if we can tell if either one of these 1V... Let's just see if this is shorted to, shorted to ground. Let's switch you back over to the microscope. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to check and see. I see that I'm more in focus on the screen than I am in my eyepieces. That means it's time to readjust things. I got my eyepieces cranked all the way down as far as they'll go, which means my next step is to change my distance here. Okay, let's see if, if this is touching ground. And it is because between, now oh, that's 5K. Let's see if I make sure I'm touching it right. So we're actually getting 6K from the middle of that to ground. Let's get this off the board. Let's get these off the board because the phone is not, I mean, it is just not going to boot like that. So being that those are on a 1V8 line, I can probably do this with my micro pencil. Um, but I'm going to try not to use hot air here if I don't have to. 
So I'm going to do this with a full size iron. And I'm going to put my curvy tip on here so that I've got some flexibility. So I don't know. These resistors for the data lines here, those, they're not bad. Like, th those are not, they're not like off the pads and knocked sideways because of liquid. They're off the pads and knocked sideways because somebody knocked them off the pads and knocked them sideways. That is not, I mean, that, that, that's just another thing that I've got to get through to figure out why they were working on this phone to start with. I'm hoping that they were working on a backlight issue, but the way that this board looks, we're going to be really lucky. So let's go ahead and straighten out this data line mess here. I'm going to anchor the board down. Where my tape go? I threw it away. Get a little hot air going. Right after I said I'm not going to use hot air, I am going to use a tiny bit. I do see one of these resistors is slightly damaged. Let's get some fluxy flux in there. I'm going to get some leaded solder here on my iron. Now when I say hot air, I am just barely raising the warmth here on this thing. And you'll be able to tell that by the way my ChipQuick SMD291 flux behave. It is the most wonderful flux in the world. Okay, the board is a little warm, and I'm going to use the side of this tip to pick these components off. Or at least to change them over to let it solder, like they are now. And we're going to remove these from the board. Okay, there's the first one. Very dainty here. I'm not I'm not doing anybody any heat here that would cause any harm. I'm simply kicking these two little dudes out of the way because they are in the wrong place. The first one was camera, first one's camera, the second one we're going to need for this phone to boot. Watch me turn into a bumbling idiot since I'm doing, doing this on camera. Oh, well, what are you going to do? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to fix this phone because I'm keeping my goals in sight. I don't care that I don't have hot tweezers. I'm still going to fix this phone. I don't care that I don't have another 2.2K ohm resistor laying around here because I just knocked two resistors off of this board. And I'll bet you money, one of them is 2.2K, and I bet it's still 2.2K. So we're going to check this one. That one is a 1K. And we're going to check this other one. And it is blown. All right, so all that Malvin, I already got one right here. We're going to need a 2.2K resistor. Be right back. All right, here we are on our donor board. Slip right in here. Wait, wait a second for my air to heat up. I'm being too spunk, spunctious. That's a com com combination between spunky and rambunctious. I'm being spunctious. All right. 
Let my cheap ass hot air station take that right off the board like it's nobody's business. And I'm going to slip right back around here to our data recovery board. Now keep in mind that there is very little that I can do to this board that is going to come anywhere remotely close to what it's been through already. So if you're about to troll me for using hot air to put this on, I still love you. Okay, back off to it once more. Make sure we got it good and hot. Okay, so that data line is now in place. Let's double check with a multimeter and we want to see that that is 2.2K and it's hotter than a firecracker right now so it may not be exactly 2.2K. I'll settle for anything close. 2K, yes, 2000 ohms, gee. Now we're going to check PP1V8 to ground. PP1V8 to ground is 3,000 ohms. 1.8 volts is not going anywhere through 3,000 ohms. So we can assume PP1V8 is safe. I don't know that it's correct, but I can promise you that it is safe. Unless when it powers on, something else magically opens the gates or close the gates, however you want to look at it, and kapow. All right, so let's continue to fondle the board. I mean, let's continue to inspect the board. Golly, I, I need a foot peg now that I move my toolbox. <coughs> toolbox has no, no business being in this shop. Alright, so let's check VCC main to ground. VCC main to ground is 50,000 ohms. 500,000, okay. Let's check backlight output to ground. Not that we care because everything is missing. Should be totally open. It is. All right, so we know VCC main is not shorted to ground. We're going to check a couple other lines. We're going to go ahead and check um, some various points down here on the NAND. We're going to check five K on that one. Just a few of these to make sure we get our three volt line. And I think we also have one V eight down here somewhere too. I'm not sure which is which. Don't really care at this point because as long as I don't have a short to ground I'm not worried about any of them and I don't care what line that it's on thirty six K should be point four Okay, that's all looking happy there. We've checked VCC main. We checked three volt line. Let's check some other lines here along the CPU. And I don't think we, like honestly, if I wasn't doing a video right now, this phone would just about to be powered on already. So we should get our same, this is gonna be what, 1V8 SDRAM over here. It's 40K to ground. Um, one of these is, uh, PPGPU, it's like one, or CPU, it's like one volt, so it should be a really, really low resistance. Yeah, it's only 200 ohms, which I thought it was actually even lower than that. And then our GPU is 50 ohms, which they're both really, really low voltages, so it's okay for them to have um, less resistance. I don't see any one of those as being dangerous because um, one volt is not going anywhere through 200 or 50 ohms. So let's go ahead and look at this board a little closer. Now that right there, that's enough to cause some bull. Like that's enough to ruin your life. See how we got this down in here? Um, let me get this board turned right on the screen so that we can talk about what this is. Oh man, the chances of this thing being okay are really slim. I don't like seeing balls squeezed out like that. All right, so here between Tom, Dick, and Harry and this coil, inductor, filter, whatever you'd want to call it, it is a winding of wire wrapped around something, whether it's air, whether it's a ferrous core, doesn't matter. We're going to call this a filter. 
I'm kidding. I'll call it an inductor. And we've got a ball between this dude and this dude. So if we look at ZXW tool, what would that ball cause? Okay, so here we're looking at ZXW tool. We have the board should be oriented the same way that it is on the screen. Let's just scroll shimmy right on down next to the CPU here. And what we've got is we've got ground on this side of this dude making contact with VCC main at this inductor. Did we check VCC main to ground? Did we? Let's check VCC main to ground. Let me give you the multimeter here. 25 million ohms. So that's not making the trip. I mean that 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 little bit there is not that's not causing us any grief, but we don't want it to cause us any grief either. Uh, we're going to get that little ball out of there. And I hope I didn't do anything silly narrowing that down, but this is a ball between ground here and VCC main here. All right, so we know we don't have a short to ground there. On, I mean, it is VCC main, but it's not backlight. That is power for chestnut. So we also have a ball squeezed out back here. Let's get in here and see what we're up against. I'm going to restart my recording because my frame rate is dying. Yes, freedom people. I'm sitting here working in my flip-flops. Flip-flops. And I feel really, really bad for, although we need them too, for people that have to go out and, and work in the weather and 10 degrees snowing with the wind blowing and they are still up on the skyscraper in their harness putting in rivets. You know, that's those guys. Those guys should all start carrying cameras with them and vlogging every day, and um, maybe one day they can start backing away from, backing away from that backbreaking work. So, let's see what we got in here. We've got a ball in here next to the CPU that looks loose. We're going to be very gentle because we're not going to crack the CPU. And then we've got between backlight output cap here, which I'm pretty sure we've got backlight severed, so we don't have to worry too much about this cap unless it is shorted. But I feel like between this cap, and I'm not going to worry too much about cracking that backlight driver because we're not going to use it. I want to make sure we don't have a short here, and we don't. That was just an illusion. Okay, let's go ahead and have a look over the back of the board here. TriStar is still there. Got lots of corrosion everywhere. Let's just kind of spot check a couple of these caps. I'm going to put my black probe on ground. And I don't even know what line these are on. 50k. Half a on oh, that's fine 30 meg half an ohm okay so I don't see any more like really gotchas like anything really really solid shorted together I don't know if this board has been through an ultrasonic cleaner but I can tell you that we've got CPU thermal compound all over these components down here CPU thermal co compound sort of looks like the stuff you find in iPhones, it looks like this. It's got all these little white beads in it, like little crystal balls. That's what that crap looks like. And it's not supposed to be down there. That belongs up on the CPU. Well, we should have our 1v8 there at that data line. We're not going to count on getting backlight because, well, 
It don't exist on this board. Let's see what happens when we hook power to it. We're going to set our supply to 4 volts. You finicky piece of trash. You're getting replaced soon. Okay. We are going to grab our iPhone 6 lead. And we're going to watch our amperage closely and see what this thing draws. Okay. 0, 0.0 amps. And I am going to fix my hotkeys before I record another video. Let's go ahead and hit the uh, hold key. We're going to bring the hold key low, assuming it's high. Let's see if we can get a power on. 900 milliamps. I mean 90 milliamps. Okay, let's check some stuff. We're at 90 milliamps. We're going to switch our multimeter over to volts. And I'm going to check and see if we have... ...1V8 here at this data line. And I do not. Okay, we're going to see if we have it at this side. And I do. Okay, I've got one V8 here, here, and here. I've got one V8 here on this rail here. On this side of my third one V8 line there. So let's get back over to ZXW tool. I have one V8 here is alive. I've got 1V8 here and it's showing somewhat of a load because it is not exactly 1V8, it's a little lower, so that shows activity. Now what I don't have here is at R0303, I'm not getting my 1V8 on this side of it. So let's go ahead and disconnect power and we're going to check for a short to ground on that side, which I don't know if I already did that, which I actually should have. I didn't. I did there in the beginning. That that should have covered it. So if we check here on our 1V8 line, I'm getting 11,000 ohms to ground. To me, that is acceptable. I mean, this is on that data line. On our other data line for camera, I'm getting 11,000 ohms to ground. 11,000 ohms to ground on both of these. I'm going to say that that's normal. What this means to me, since we're not getting our 1V8 signal here at R0303, to me, it means that there's something on that line that's pulling it to ground. So, we have somewhere to go. This phone, it drew the sort of power you would see from a phone that doesn't have any data communications between the onboard ICs. And let's see, what all could it be? It could be our backlight driver. It's not pulling it to ground when the phone's not powered on. When the phone powers on, something has given that a pathway to ground. Let's double check that our resistor is 2.2K. And if it is, I'm not going to nitpick on the resistor. Because I doubt, highly doubt, that it would be a bad resistor. And we get 2.2K. Okay, let's do this one more time for the sake of being absolutely positive. And let's also see, okay, so we have it on backlight here, we've got it on chestnut. That line also pops up down on the back of the board. 
I believe we've got that under TriStar. So we've got TriStar, Chestnut, and Backlight Driver are possibilities for that line. Now we can also look at the schematic. Let's search this down in the schematic and let's find this line. All right, let's be absolutely sure. We're going to power this board back on. And we're going to do that by bringing the hold key L line to L. And being that that works means that we have 1v8 at this pin. All right, so there is our 80 milliamps, which means that this board is now on. And I'm going to get in and I'm going to check for that 1v8 signal or the data line on this side. Here's where our 1v8 is. Let's switch this to volts instead of ohms. I'm glad these meters are smarter than I am. On this side we get our 1.8 and on this side 0 0.07. So there is something pulling it down. Does anybody want to place bets as to what it is? Let's have one more good look over this board and see if we can make an educated guess. All right, where did our water go? Ah, let's have a look. So there was clearly some backlight issues here. There's a cap missing. We got some missing pads. Okay. I think a lot of what I'm seeing is ultrasonic cleaner damage. That's one thing that really sucks about prior repair attempts. Oh, and I'm sure that data line pops up under the PMIC as well, right? Yeah, here it is. It's under our, it's under our two. Okay, so there's a few things here that could be pulling that to ground, but I'm sure that we do not have a data line there. Something is pulling it to ground. This is a hunk of solder paste. This, you don't want this floating around on your phone. I mean, th th this has no business anywhere other than where it's supposed to be. All right, so this could be anybody, man. I mean, we have corrosion everywhere. This could be anybody. Let me just go ahead and start with something we don't need. Let's get rid of the backlight driver. Okay, let's let the hot air start warming up. And see if we can find what's pulling AP underscore BI underscore I2C0 underscore SDA to ground upon boot. Because that line does not, doesn't test to have any problems until you push the power button and then you get 1V8 on this side of the resistor, but on the 2.2K side of the resistor, you get nothing. So there's something taking everything. Um, let's see what it is. Maybe it's the backlight driver. And I get to move on with this repair so that I can remove, move on with my repairs and that I can make more people happy and that they will all love me. Okay. Board's almost up to temp. The reason why I know that is because I've done these over and over and over and over and over. I wonder why they went this far and never pulled the backlight driver. I think it's because they weren't quite sure of themselves. And that's why we had one of our data line pull-up resistors turn sideways and the other one turn sideways. And all right, okay, so I'm gonna get my blade under here and I'm gonna watch this corner ball right now. It's starting to melt and it's gone. Very little heat. See how quickly we did that? Hardly any heat. And we stopped. Not going to do anything else to back Mr. Backlight Driver because Mr. Backlight Driver can go screw himself. We do not need backlight for data. I should have checked to see if I had a passcode before doing all this. All right, let's let this board cool. And the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to power it back on. And... First of all, see if our load goes beyond 80 or 90 milliamps. Second of all, see if the pull-up resistor for our data line can hold that line high. And we wait. 
Okay, this board should be cooled now. We're going to go ahead and hook our backlight boxless screen. Huh? We're going to verify our power supply is still within reasonable voltage. And we're going to connect our lead. Carefully watching amperage. Okay. Amperage passes. And we're going to spin right around here and press the power button. Okay, we had 90 milliamps and then it went away. Hundred and forty milliamps, two hundred milliamps. This looks like normal booting. I don't know if you can see that or not, but we have Apple logo. See there? We're going to wait for this thing to do a full boot. And then I'm going to verify touch works. Okay, we do not have working touch, but we do have boot. This phone did boot. So let's go ahead and disconnect our power supply. And we now know that our data line is now at 1.8 volts and it is working or we would not have a booting phone. And what that means to me is that the backlight driver was actually faulty and it was pulling the I2C0 SDA line to ground upon power on. So now we need to figure out why we don't have any touch. Was it my screen? Was it the phone? Why does this phone not have touch? Let's see if we can get a good look at the chestnut I see. I'm going to raise my microscope up. And see if I can have a good look here at chestnut. Because we had all sorts of intrusions here along the top side here. It's not like no touch after a fall. This is no touch after liquid. Well, we've got a lot, a lot of damage here on the bottom of the board, guys. That little, little dude there is missing some stuff. We've got quite a bit of corrosion right here on the bottom of the board. I think we are safe to say that our issues are going to be localized to right here. Let's just go ahead and take a few basic measurements here and see... How much of this I have to worry about? Do we have any immediate shorts? We have 1.8 ohms, 0.7 ohms on this side of this dude. On this side, 40k. One ohm, okay. Okay, before we do any major repairs here, before we go floating touch ICs or doing anything crazy, let's look for other reasons that this thing may not have touch. Is there anything obvious? You know, those guys are good because we got image. Pretty sure these dudes are good because we got image. Top side, the board looks okay. I would say the obvious is damage right here on the bottom. All right, let's get our board turned right. I'm going to just start. I'm going to pick around ZXW here and see who is who and what is what because we've got some that are obviously burnt. So let me give you screen capture. 
and microscope, I'm going to have a look at just to the bottom left of the audio codec. We've got this here. That's for proximity sensor. We don't have to worry about that. That's bullshit. We've got this guy here. This is PP5E7 Sage AV. Can't talk. AVDDH. And that goes directly into this tantalum capacitor. I believe that's a tantalum capacitor. Sage boost out. And if we look at that really closely, you will see that that is corroded all the way off right there. I don't think I have enough light to show you. Let me see if I can get in there and pick at it with the blade. A lot of corrosion, but I think it's still connected. Okay, we're going to see what this dude is down in here. Come back to that cap here in just a second. So, back over to the ZXW tool. So that cap is actually feeding the Mason IC directly. It looks highly important. I don't think this thing's going to get touched without it. And here is another cap. for touch caps for touch so all these caps for touch here they are really 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 screwy C5202RF is missing let's see if we can have a good look at this cap Let's say there's enough of it, enough, enough of it touching that it, it should actually work. All right, we're going to need touch for this to work. Let's verify that it wasn't my screen. I would feel so dumb if I do a major surgery on this phone, only to come, only to find out that the last time I disconnected my screen, I tore the ribbon and it no longer has working touch. No working touch. All right, so we know that it's not the screen. Let's dig into this a little farther. I am gonna go ahead and tape the board down to the table. And there's uh, liquid damage all over this phone. There is no telling. No telling what our touch issue here is, but I can tell you we have one cap that's really screwy. We got, um, a really really nasty looking part of the board down here so I'm gonna start raising the temperature of this board at this point we're at a touch repair all right and let's start contemplating pulling this chip off the board we're gonna give us a nice little sliggity slice across here Okay, let's see what life looks like under see what life looks like under this dude. Okay, this is cat piss. That is in the trash. That is why this thing has no touch. Let's flux it down, guys. Let's see what this thing is going to troll me through. I start the camera expecting to do a quick little, this is what these guys overlooked video. And you know what? It's exactly what I got. All right, so let's get rid of all this cat puke. Maybe it's puke. Maybe it's not pee. This might be puke. Okay, 
let's try to take as much of that off the board on our iron as I can because this is most likely some sort of dissolved salts it's definitely dissolved solids that have resolidified on this board okay maybe not dissolved solids but they were carried by liquid damn it and there's a good chance this is chlorine or left over something from somebody's pee and we don't want that that's gonna be chlorine that's gonna get me a fume extractor right down here in front of my face but we don't want those salts to run anywhere whenever I clean this with alcohol because dissolved solids is what makes water conductive water by itself hardly conducts any electricity it's the electrolytes it's the dissolved solids in the water that causes it to be conductive and that makes all the difference in the world so let's say let's say you had a 1.8 volt line right next to a 20 volt line and they're this far apart and a drop of water hits it well to the 1.8 volt line that's not such a big deal but if you take a drop of let's say seawater and put that drop of water between the 20 volt line and the 1v8 line that 1v8 line is going to go whoa hey and that's that's where you get into trouble so when it comes to electrical damage that's caused by smash connectors and things like that it can happen due to electrolytic fluid and it can also happen due to physical damage so if you've got a 5.7 volt line right next to a 1.8 volt line and the connector gets smashed and those two get shorted, you can cause damage along the 1.8 volt line just the same as you can if chlorinated water gets inside the phone. And, you know, it's not as much of a short, but the dissolved solids make it a hell of a lot more short than distilled water. So, um, all right, we've pretty well got our site cleaned up here for Mason. That's pretty damn nasty. Should I go ahead and pull Cumulus? Should I go ahead and pull the audio codec? The phone boots. It boots but has no touch. Let's leave it. Let's replace Mason. Dun da 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 da. That's what I'm gonna say when I get the data off of this phone. I have a whole pile of these things lined up for data recovery. But for the sake of video, I picked one that's been around the world a few times. And see if we can put some thought behind this and figure it out. And not like Bass Fishing Show figure it out either. Like This is really figuring it out. Look with our eyeballs, what's missing, what's the behavior of the phone. Oh, we only draw 100 milliamps and stop? I bet you're missing a data line. In this case, the data line wasn't missing. It was getting destroyed by the backlight driver. Damn ass backlight driver. We don't even need you. We do need balls on this chip, though. No good as a chip without balls. Da -da. I don't know why I forget to turn my hot air on before I put that paste in there. That would be real smart. Oh, it's because I'm recording a video. And all thought patterns get rearranged. Because I have to focus on play buttons and SD cards. And record time. And camera angles. And woo! Alright, we gave it the gift of new balls. Let's see if we can get the stick to the table. Come on, stick to the table. I'm recording, damn you. Yeah. All right. They know not to double cross me while I'm recording my video. Chestnut IC will hit the wall. All right. Back over to this board. Let's verify our balls are straight. We have nice symmetrical balls. Let's verify our orientation. We are orientated right. This Mason IC will fit right into its home. Will it have touch? I kind of doubt it. Not with what we just found lurking under this thing. 
Looks like dog vomit. Alright, let's get this thing back in place. I hope to God I don't have to do any like real troubleshooting today. careful with this because we don't want to have question about how the chip went down. We want to know that this part's good. Do not make me look like a fool right after I said we're going to do this right. You son of a biscuit eater. Okay, this board is sufficiently cooled. We're not going to run it on the power supply no more because of what can happen with battery data lines. And I'm going to thank iPad Rehab for that. That's, that's excellent content. I had only done that on accident. Wait a minute. iPad Rehab or Chris Long? Now, I'm, I want to give credit to like the right party, but I heard about it from both of you at about the same time, and it was just after I roached my first iPhone board by plugging in a bad battery and um, what happened to me was I plugged in the battery I got busy I turned around doing stuff and I noticed the Apple logo more than once didn't pay it much attention until I turned back and it was a blank screen it was DFU mode and that happened from me leaving it sitting there boot looping and lucky for me that's the only time I've ever had that happen uh, the only time I've ever had that happen at least that I know about and it was on a phone where it was supposed to get wiped anyway data was not was not a concern so I really lucked out and um, thanks guys for letting the whole world know that that's a big deal so because of that I'm not gonna boot this phone up anymore on my supply I know that this board now boots and I don't need to run it from my supply I know about what the current draw is I don't think that's going to help me troubleshoot touch. So let's put this in a real housing because now we have a board that boots. Now I don't have backlight and I'm not going to have backlight either until I have data. And after I have data, um, I might get backlight back on this phone. But I kind of doubt it. This thing's in really rough shape. I'm going to get these people their data and uh, you know what? They would really like for the phone to start up enough for them to touch the screen. It's in bad shape, man. This thing's in really bad shape. All right, well, let's see what we can do. So let's go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and hook up Dock Connector because the moment that I have touch, I'm going after data. And let's hook up a screen without the backlight box because that is much easier than what I just did to this other one to verify that I had a working screen, knowing that both of these screens worked. Chances of them both not working is slim to nothing. All right, let's hook up a battery this time. We're going to flip the screen up and over onto my microscope because I use the light from my microscope head to light up the screen. I don't think I'm copying anybody there. I think that's the best way to do it. All right, so let's connect a charger. And we get Apple logo. Huh? All right, let's let this thing boot. I'm going to get a drink. I heard a buzz buzz. Zzz, zzz, so that knows that it's charging. And the screen becomes really dim. Okay, we got a swipe. And we have working touch. I'm going to go ahead and blank the screen. Have a look here and see if I've got a passcode because this one and Attempted in Peru, Ecuador, United States, and Ohio, and Dallas. You're my last hope. See, when you read things like that, it really makes you want to try extra hard. So I have a phone here that now has working touch. I'm going to set that aside because I don't have a passcode in front of me for it, and, and this is passcoded. 
K. This is somebody that doesn't want me to have the passcode. They've they've made that clear and they want this phone to work well enough for them to be able to get the data. So what that means to me is that um, means I got to finish fixing the phone with the data in hand, and that's I don't like doing that. That that's a real pain in the ass. Um, so let's be careful. Let's go ahead and fix this phone and get backlight working. And I'm going to send this phone back to them working so that they can do their data recovery. Man. All right, let's see what we're up against. This guy is in the United States, I think, so it's not that big of a deal to ship it back and forth, but man, we sure take a risk on not being able to retrieve the data because at this point, I've got it. You know, I've got it. The, the, this data is mine. I can plug this thing and back it up, but I have to have the passcode and um, I don't have a passcode and I'm not going to have a passcode so let's move this stuff out of the way let's make this so that they can transfer their own data we're going to fix the backlight folks alright let me make sure everybody's recording because I just tacked another 30 minutes onto my 2 hour long repair video Alright, let's get you over to the microscope. And let's give this thing the gift of new backlight. Tell you what, everybody that's telling me that they want to set their bench up like mine, if you do, don't put the supply right where you put the uh, the iron because you'll burn you'll burn your cords all day long. So we're going to heat this up a little bit, and we're going to plow down all these pads. There we go, nice and plowed. All right, use some tweezers, pick out the gunk. We do have a uh, missing pad here on backlight diode. Let's see what we can do to deal with that. We got a um, missing cap up here. All right, let's get in there with some alcohol and clean this up so I can see what I'm looking at. I need this repair off of my bench because I did quote a price on this and I like to keep my prices. I don't raise them unexpectedly, which sometimes really sucks, but it keeps my customers coming back. They like to be treated that way. I try to give people good surprises. So let's deal with this. We have a torn trace here. This is for backlight. We're gonna strip this back just to fuzz. I'm going to switch over to my micro pencil. Yes, real world repair. You have to uh, you have to have the guts for it. You have to think about it because if you just dig in trying stuff, look at how many thousands of things that could be wrong here. Your chances of solving it if you're just trying things are really really slim. You have to you have to think about it. And um, actually out of filters. Worst component in the world to be out of, so I'm going to pull that off of a donor board. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and rebuild this section of the backlight. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is pin, uh, tin up the crappy excuse for a pad we have on the diode. See our diode goes right here. And that's some crappy baloney. It's not going to have anything sticking to it so let's get some solder on it let's get some more solder on it like a lot of it there we go plenty of solder there we go because we're going to be sliding this little prick around ah yeah plenty there we go so we got plenty of solder on both sides uh let's go ahead 
Let's go ahead and dilute the solder on the coil. Although I'm pretty sure these whoops, these people were doing this with leaded. Now I'm in a hurry because like I need to move on with my day, and this just uh, this makes me so nervous. Because now, and that's way too much solder on these pads for a coil. Because now I've got data, and I got to continue to put heat on this because somebody um has a personal life. All right, so let's go after diode first. This data repair, this data recovery video would have been over right at the moment I entered the passcode, but I had to stick my neck out and like I'm going to do this one all the way to the very end. And now I'm stuck fixing this damn thing. I should have just been like, "All right, guys, I got the data. Have a good day." And I'd be good. But instead, I'm stuck overthinking things like humans are not any longer supposed to like you're not supposed to use your brain anymore that is made obvious oh you little diode prick get in there right now there's at least Five people watching my channel right now going, he's going to solder it backwards. Gotcha, didn't I? All right, let's turn this around. And now you see, since where pad's missing, can you see what I'm doing? The pad is missing here. So I'm actually soldering it on to the trace. I'm going to set it off center. And I'm going to push it up there to the trace. I'm not going to put in a wire here. That would just take forever. There we go. A little farther. We don't want this too cold. There we go. So we got that diode to pull itself up onto the trace and here, but I had to use a shit ton of solder to make it happen. Let's go ahead and grab us a new driver. And let's add some flux to the board so that we can call it a day and send this phone back working and pray to God whenever it gets back to whatever wherever, whenever it gets back to wherever it's going it still has backlight and it still boots although I don't think that data line is going to spontaneously short itself to ground again unless watch after I replace this diet after I rebuild this backlight circuit watch then we have that data line shorted to ground again. I'll, I'll I'll puke all over the place. I will. I'll just, I'll just throw up right now. Because that means in order to get paid, I have to talk him out of a passcode. <laughs> and uh, okay, let's let's put this driver down. Om. 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 Om's law. Thank you, drive through. Oh, yeah. All right, let's get our backlight coil, inductor, our backlight inductor. Last coil, that's lovely. If you blow this coil, we're not friends anymore. I really should wick off a big chunk of that solder. Because that's probably too much solder. Why would we do that? Good enough. Let's give it once more. We're good. All right, so we have a coil in place. We're going to go ahead and put our VCC main caps back in place because we don't want any weird things happening. <laughs> this was supposed to be a short video. It's almost noon. Pull this nice cap off here. Sit it here. And then we're going to pull this, this, this lovely... Actually, let's leave that one. Eh, let's not leave that one. 
Let's get over here and find one that's a little less liquid damaged. 10 microfarad, 6.3 volts. Do, 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 do. C1200, right? Do, 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 do. Menomena. All right. I'll put this little dude here. All right, we're going to get some backlightage on this phone. I guess I'll look on the bright side. I get to send it back without copying data. But the dim side of that's a lot worse. I don't get to send it back knowing for damn sure that I've got the data, and that sucks. This is like one of the only times I'll be worried about warrantying data recovery. Because like, if he gets it back and it don't boot, like I have to have him send it back. Because he's going to want his data. And if he sends it back to me with a passcode, good chance I can get the data. Okay. I never switched these pads here. Over to leaded. That was dumb. So let's get some leaded solder in here. Nah, you know what? We are not going to worry about this too much. If this cap was not in here, we've got one of those two. That would be fine. I have seen these things run on one of those two. They come in all the time with one missing. It seems to be like a diagnostic check people do. They just yank one of those off the board. There we go. Those two are on. Pleasantly crooked, which we can live with. All right, now, we were missing FL2024. Does anybody remember? Let's get FL2024 back on the board and probably run a jumper to that pin. Okay. Too much solder. Good enough. Now we're going to get in and see what the pin looks like. Um, let's put FL2024 back on the board first. Spin it around, get some flux on it. Okay. That's back on the board. Connector is only remotely burnt. We're okay with that. But now we're going to need to see if it can actually work. actually carving back into the plastic a little bit so that I can scrape away at the pin on this connector. I have no idea if you'll be able to see it or not. I'm trying to do this under extreme precision because I don't want to really screw up and cause extra work here because this job is almost done. It's going to get a light alcohol treatment, but it will not get ultrasonic clean. If I ultrasonic clean it, it may actually go back not working, and that, that would be bad. Too big of a long.
Let's get some reflex in there, and then I'm going to try to get a bigger blob on it. Sometimes whenever I'm doing these, like this is a pin that I've had to solder frequently. It's not so bad when I'm changing the whole connector because I'll like fudge it all the way off to one side, solder one side, and then I float it with hot air and then solder the other side. Um, but this one here is really, really tough to get to the way it is now. They don't have to be perfect. I have no idea how much time went by with my headset disconnected, so there's a good chance you're going to wind up with audio from a really loud source. At least I got it though, right? I like having more than one source. Okay, we are going to call that good. And I'm not going to worry about any of the other pins on that connector because it was working. So let's uh, let's not do anything dumb. Think about this for a minute. Let's check backlight output for shorts. So I'm going to give you microscope. I'm going to turn on the multimeter. And we're going to slide right over here, and we're going to check backlight output and VCC main. So I'm getting 8 million ohms on backlight output. 300K, that's acceptable. Let's check VCC main. I'm getting whatever that was was acceptable. I'm going to get now between pin 1 on our connector here. Okay, keep that in mind so I can't zoom out any farther. And then I'm going to get between backlight output over by our IC and we should get close to 0 ohms. 1.3, we'll take it. All right, so we don't have any shorts to ground on backlight output. I do have a connection to the pin on the display all the way to backlight anode at the driver, which tells me we should have now working backlight on this phone. So, I'm going to grab a known good housing. And I'm going to pop the board into it. We are now going to hook up a screen. And if we do happen to get working backlight, notice I've ripped through my glove. If we happen to get working backlight, I... We'll move on to my next phone. I might do a little bit to tidy this one up just to make sure it's hopefully going to have his data on it when he gets it back. All right, we're going to get smoke. <gasps> no smoke. I think anybody working on the iPhone 6 backlights have this at least a little bit of underlying fear that when they hook up the battery, they're going to see a chimney. All right, let's see if we get backlight, image, boot, Yay! Backlight! I don't have to eat out of the trash can! Alright, so, rather than drag this video out for another hour and a half, I am going to set this phone aside. Actually, let's go ahead and let it boot. We're just going to wait for this thing to boot. Z -z 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 charger connect this battery is at 100% and we have really sluggish there on the first slide just like it did before almost a little bit scary isn't it alright so here we go screen up
that could actually be my screen. However, all right, screen up. It was my screen. And he is ready to enter his passcode and back up his data. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hook it up to a computer and I'm going to make sure, turn my volume up nice and loud, I'm going to make sure this thing is detected as an iPhone that is passcoded. Yay! Connected. And we're good. We're going to stop right there. All right. So there you have it, everybody. Um, this phone has been around the world. It has been to like Peru. It's been to multiple states. It has been in multiple repair shops. And any one of those shops could have gotten this phone to come up had they checked, checked the data lines. And that is another really, really, really common repair that you're going to bump into where you've already tried TriStar and, you, you know, you've already tried all the Please Bro solutions and this phone still draws 90 milliamps and stops. Well, you might want to check the data lines. Um, that's what this one was. They just were physically not connected. So I kind of feel like, here, here's my theory. This phone was originally liquid damaged and it was a backlight issue. And I think in troubleshooting and trying to get the backlight to work, the pull-up resistors for the data lines were knocked off. At least one of them that was essential there was knocked off. And then all of a sudden this phone would no longer boot. It went from being a no backlight issue to a no boot issue. So we found the issue not that was causing this thing to not power on. We fixed it. The phone powered on with no touch. I found the issue with touch, which looked like somebody vomited under the uh, Mason Touch IC. So we reballed a replacement IC, put it on there. We then had working touch, but I don't have a passcode. This customer wants to handle their own. The hell is that? This customer wants to handle their own data, so I had to fix backlight. So here I have fixed the phone that won't boot because of a, um, a data line. Well, no, no, it wasn't. Okay, let me back up. The data line was not only knocked off, but it was being pulled down by the backlight driver. So that's not to say that this started out as a no backlight. At any rate, there was a lot of stuff here that was overlooked. We fixed the issue with the data line not existing. Then we fixed the issue with the backlight driver pulling the data line to ground. And then um, we restored touch. And then we repaired the backlight. And this phone is going to go back, ready for him to have his data after it has been all around the world and he can finally have his pictures back. So, folks, that is going to be it for this video. I hope you have successful repairs. I hope I do too. And um, I thank you for watching and I thank you for subscribing. I thank you for your likes, all your comments. Uh, this channel is growing way, way faster than I intended it to. And for that, I am eternally grateful. So, um, everybody, have a good day and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.